What matters most and lasts forever? When I was told that this is the topic that I got to speak about today, I was immediately overwhelmed. That I've got a half an hour to share with you that thing which matters most and lasts forever. But quickly in my preparation, it, it came to me and I figured it out. God matters most and lasts forever. Amen. Let's close in prayer. No, the reality is this, this is a big deal. And I got to tell you that every time one of us has the opportunity to come up here and to share a message with you from God's word, we do take it seriously. Whatever the topic is, we know that sharing God's word is a big deal. And we want to do the best to honor God. Well, we are in the last week of our series on Ecclesiastes, What Matters Most and Lasts Forever. And if I put out a survey and asked, to, asked you to answer what matters most, that list would be very long. It could be health, it could be finances, it could be security, it could be family. It could be a lot of different things. And many of those things would be wonderful, great things. But when we talk about specifically what matters most, I think that's a different topic and a little bit shorter of a list. I think that when God wants us to focus on certain things, it's because he knows that those will make a greater impact. Well, as I said, we're on the book of Ecclesiastes, and Pastor Kevin a couple weeks ago talked about Ecclesiastes being a book that was written to people who are feeling tired and disenchanted with the world and with life. That Ecclesiastes is a book that is written to people who are working hard, who are striving for success, but still feeling empty. That Ecclesiastes was written to a people who are exploring every kind of pleasure, but still wanting more. That Ecclesiastes is written to people who are looking for status and prestige, and still feeling like they haven't arrived. And I don't know if you noticed, but I used the word are, that the book Ecclesiastes is written to people who are. I think it's easy for us to look at the Bible and look at messages in the Bible, look at God's word in the Bible, and think that this was written for people generations ago, that this was written thousands of years ago, and it applied only then. But the reality is that this word is for us today as it was for them back then. I want to start by reading Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains forever. Those words, to me, are not very encouraging. In fact, I would say they're outright discouraging. Meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. The truth of the matter is that when we focus on the wrong things, it is meaningless. When we focus on the wrong things, we will be discouraged. When we focus on the wrong things, we will feel unfulfilled. I do believe that it's important to identify those things that are meaningless, those things that we really should weed out of our life, those things that we really shouldn't focus on. But today, what I want us to look at is that which is meaningful. Those things that if we focus on them, we will not be discouraged, but we will be encouraged. We will not be hopeless, but we will be hopeful. We're going to look at what matters most and what lasts forever. And we've been looking at that as one question, what matters most and lasts forever. But today, I'm going to break it up into two pieces. I'm going to spend some time looking at what matters most and then I'm going to wrap up at the end with a very specific what lasts forever. 
And I want to tell you up front, and I'll probably remind you later on, that this list that God gave me of what matters most is not an all-encompassing list. Because the reality is what matters most is God. What matters most and lasts forever is God and his love for us. But what matters most can be broken down into some other pieces that I want us to spend some time in. Solomon is known as being the wisest man to ever live. And Solomon is credited with writing Ecclesiastes. Solomon was a man who was wise. Solomon was a man who had wealth. He had everything that he could possibly desire. He had power. He had it all. And yet in the end, he said, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Despite what he had, he recognized that a focus on those things is not what it's all about. As Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, he wrote a bit about wisdom. And I want to read from Ecclesiastes 7, chapter 7, verses 11 through 12. We read, Wisdom like an inheritance is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. It's clear from these two verses that wisdom is an incredibly beneficial thing. That wisdom is good for us. And I think often when we look at wisdom, we think about people who have lived long lives, who've had great experience, who've had lots of highs and lows, and they've grown from it, and they've learned from it, and now they're wise. And the truth is that there is some validity to that, and that people do gain wisdom from their life experiences. But I think, I think we're talking about something different here. In Paul's book to the church at Corinth, he writes in the first book, chapter 3, verse 19, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Because here's the thing that I think he's trying to say, is that there's two kinds of wisdom. There's a wisdom that's of this world, and there's a wisdom that's not of this world. That there's an earthly wisdom that is attained by man, and there's a wisdom that comes from God. There is truly a difference between the two. And today as we look ahead at wisdom specifically, I want us to think about it as godly wisdom. The not wisdom that we are going to attain from our experiences, but wisdom that we are going to attain from God. One of the New Testament Bible books, books of the Bible that's about wisdom was written by Jesus' brother James. The book of James is full of wisdom. He says in chapter 1, verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. This is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Because I really believe that if we follow this, our lives will be different. That as we engage in those things that God wants to teach us, if we don't do anything with it, we miss out and we deceive ourselves. And so for me, my goal, whenever I get to hear teaching, my goal whenever I read a Bible verse, my goal when I read a devotion or when I listen to a worship song is that I can take that word and not just hear it, but do what it says and apply it to my life. I've been praying for weeks for each person that's going to hear this message that they would do that. And it was starting with myself. And I thought it appropriate for me to actually take this moment right now and pause and pray that for each of us today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I can tell you for me that it is so easy to hear a word from you, to hear a message, to read a passage, and then just move on. And Father, I pray that today, those who are hearing this message today in this courtyard, those who are hearing this message today in cars parked in our parking lot, or online, or those who are going to hear this message in the days and weeks and months to come, Lord, would take some truth that you want to convey, 
And not just hear it, but do what it says. Father, please change our lives today through your word, through your message for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God provides a way for us to gain his wisdom. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. I can't count the amount of times that I have read that passage and not ask God for wisdom. And most recently, as I read through that passage, the last seven words stood out to me in a different way. James says, and it will be given to you. You see, it's a promise. It's a commitment from God that if we ask him for wisdom, he'll give it to us. That we don't have to stumble around looking for it, but that he will provide what we need. The best place to start in asking God for wisdom is directly to him. It's simply asking him through prayer. It's reaching out to God and sharing with him what you need wisdom for. It's asking him to speak into your life. It's asking him to, to guide you and to direct you, to fill, him with, to fill you with his Holy Spirit and have his spirit direct your steps. We can seek wisdom through God directly through prayer, and we can seek wisdom through God directly through his word, the Bible. Here at Shoreline Church, we are all about spiritual growth. Our mission statement here is to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. And what that means is that we want everybody possible to hear the truth about God's love for them. We want every person possible to know that God loves them so much that he sent Jesus to die for their sins. But then we also want people to grow in that faith. And that's where the total commitment to Jesus Christ comes in. And we've identified here at Shoreline seven spiritual growth markers, seven areas that we think if you pour into these areas, if you pursue these areas, that you will become totally committed to Jesus Christ. These are Bible engagement and passionate prayer. They're wholehearted worship and humble service. They're joyful generosity and consistent community and organic outreach. But it starts with Bible engagement, the first of those seven. But these seven, as we pursue them, we will see our lives changed. We will see ourselves more in tune with God. We will see ourselves more committed to Jesus Christ. I want to share that with you because that's the framework of how we move forward. Because we really believe that God does not want to see us stagnant and right where we are. Wherever we are on our spiritual journey, wherever we are on our walk with Jesus, whether we have not accepted him or we've been walking with Jesus for 50 years, he wants to see us grow and take that next step. And Bible engagement is a good start with that. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. I love the word dwell in there. Dwell means to take up residence. Let the message of Christ take up residence among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. You see, God doesn't want the word of God to be something we visit on occasion. He doesn't want the word of God to be something that we sporadically place into our lives, but that he wants the word of God to dwell among us. His living an active word, to be present and part of our daily lives. So what does Bible engagement look like? Well, in large part, it looks like reading the Bible. It looks like coming to church services and hearing the Bible. It looks like studying the Bible, memorizing the Bible. 
having conversations with people about the Bible. God wants us to engage with the Bible, to allow it to be fully part of our lives and live in our midst and dwell among us. And when we do, God will do amazing things in us and through us, through the wisdom that we can get, the direction that we can get directly from his word. Another source of wisdom that God gives us is people. Proverbs 19.20 says, listen to advice and accept discipline. And at the end, you'll be counted among the wise. Another thing that matters most is relationships. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, I think, gives a great picture of the importance of relationships. Not only as it will be a source of wisdom, but so much more. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, we read, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. When we talk about relationships in the context of the church, what we're really talking about is what we call a spiritual marker of consistent community. The Bible uses multiple pictures of what community is, and, and one is a family, that we have relationships with one another as mothers and fathers have relationships with their children, and husbands and wives have relationships with them, that we are brothers and sisters in the church and in the body of Christ. Another picture of community in the church is a body. And I love this picture because the body is always with us. This is something that we all have different experiences with our family. And maybe our family isn't the greatest picture of what the church community can be. But the body we understand because we all have a body. We all know what happens when something goes wrong with our body and how it affects the rest of our body. Uh, I'm a runner. I love running. It is one of my greatest joys in all the world. And about 11 weeks ago, I went on a run, and when I was done, I was setting up here for an event, and all of a sudden, I had this horrible ache in my foot. And the ache got worse day by day, and by the next week, my calf was hurting, and my knee was hurting, and my hip was hurting, and this was 11 weeks ago, and I took 10 weeks off. Last Friday was my first run in 10 weeks. My whole point in this is not feel sorry for me because I can't run. It's that a pain in my foot has completely impacted the rest of my body. That something wrong in my foot has impacted all the way up my side, and my physical being is not the same because of a pain in my foot. But you know what? My emotional being isn't the same because of an ache in my foot either. Because I haven't been able to get that thing that so fills me up. Some of my greatest time with God is when I'm out on a trail or out on a path running, and I haven't had that, and it's because of an ache in my foot. The church community, when there's aches, affect the rest. When there's something going wrong with one of us in this body, it really should affect the rest. See, we're meant to work together as one. We're meant to be joined together as one unit. Now, while my foot is paining me, if I cut it off and set it over there on the side, it would do me absolutely no good. It only does me any good when it's connected to the body. And that is what consistent community is about. It's about being connected to the body of Christ. Being connected to the church. In Genesis, we read that it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. We were created in the image of God who himself is in community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally in community as one. Consistent community is built in 
to who we are. Consistent community offers wisdom, as I said, but consistent community also offers accountability. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. When we are in community with one another, when we are sharing our lives with one another, we have an opportunity to sharpen one another. I love the picture of two blades being sharpened on each other. And as opposed to both of them becoming duller, both of them become sharper. When we sharpen one another, we become better. Accountability, though, is a hard thing. We don't really like by nature, to have people challenge us. We don't really like people pointing out those things that are our shortcomings. We feel like we've got a good enough handle on it. I know, I'm one of those people. But I can honestly stand up here today and say that I am a better person in so many ways because of accountability. I'm a better father because I've been challenged in how I parent my children. I'm a better husband because of being challenged on how I treat my wife. I'm a better follower of Jesus because I've been challenged on how I pursue not only these seven spiritual growth markers, but how I pursue my relationship with God. Accountability is not easy. Being sharpened is not easy, but, but the end result is worth it. When we sharpen one another, we are better prepared to be used by God for his purposes. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, And let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That first part is all about sharpening one another. It's all about accountability and challenging each other. To challenge each other to be better, to do more, to press on. To be a better example in this world, to share our faith with people for love and good deeds, to become more like Christ, to grow in our faith. But then it continues on, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Consistent community is a source of wisdom, and a source of accountability, and a source of of encouragement. This past year has been tough for many of you, I know. It's been tough for me. This past year plus has been full of discouragement. Discouragement with school. Discouragement with sickness and health, obviously with COVID. Discouragement in employment. Discouragement in finances. Discouragement in relationships or an inability to cultivate and pour into relationships. It's just been a year of discouragement. While this past year has maybe been intensified in discouragement, the reality is that once this year passes and we move forward and COVID is in our past and businesses are back open, we're still going to have plenty of discouragement in our lives and we're going to need encouragement. About nine years ago, my wife and I started on this journey of foster and adoption. And even the moment that I recall back to that, I get choked up because we made a decision that we were going to pursue fostering and adopting a child. It has been the absolute hardest experience of my life. Yeah, this last year has been tough, but I got to tell you, I've got years of tough before that. And I know you've had years of tough before that as well. I can't count the number of days that I've been discouraged, that my wife has been discouraged, that my kids have been discouraged, including my son who we adopted. Discouragement has been rife in this season for us. We found some places of hope and some places of encouragement. And for for my wife and I, one of those places has been the Refresh Conference. And for years, we've gone up to the Seattle area. It's Redmond, Washington. We've gone to this Refresh Conference. And every year, as we've gone day by day feeling discouraged, we've 
looked at the calendar and we've looked forward to the end of February, the beginning of March, it changed some weeks, that's when refresh is. That's when we'll get the encouragement. We're looking forward to that. We're holding on to that. It's going to be amazing. One of the things I love more than anything else is this specific communication that takes place, this special kind of encouragement up there. And it's walking down the hallway of this conference with thousands of other people in the same position as me. And making eye contact, say with another dad, a nod of the head, not a word said, but an amazingly profound message communicated. I see you. I'm with you. You're honoring God. Do not give up. You're making a difference. When I find myself in that community, in that place, I feel like I've got the strength to go on, to continue further, to keep fighting because I know others are in the fight with me. And I know for many of you that same thing happens to you. And it's because of consistent community that you have that. And we have a refreshed community on Facebook and we can be discouraged and share our stories and get input and encouragement from those people. But the truth is Seattle's far away and Facebook's pretty impersonal. So, you know, we've been praying about what we can do here locally to come up with something that can encourage people in this arena of foster and adoption. So if any of you are interested, if any of you have something on your heart that says, hey, I'd like to be part of that, please reach out to me. I'd love to talk. I'd love to pray about what that could look like because I know that this area needs something within the church community to help in that world. Exodus 17, 10 through 12. It says, so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other so that his hands remained steady until sunset. And Joshua defeated the Amalekites with the sword. Consistent community offers a lot of things. Wisdom, accountability, encouragement, and support. I want to ask you today, because I really believe it, starts with us individually. Whose arms are you holding up? Who are you supporting during their difficult time? I love the picture of Moses' hands growing tired and him having two men come beside him and help him. There's so many days. So many days when my arms are tired. And I know I'm not alone. I know there are so many days when your arms are tired, but it starts with each of us individually and then us collectively in community to lean on one another, to turn to one another. If you need help, ask. If your arms are tired, say something. If you see someone else who's struggling, support them. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've been involved in the Christian community, that I've been supported. I can remember when my oldest daughter was two and she was hospitalized for eight days. We didn't know what our future was going to hold. We didn't know how we were going to make it. We had like 17 people from Shoreline Church show up in the waiting room, surround us in prayer. In two weeks, she's graduating high school intelligent, bright, beautiful, and wonderful. But there was a time when I wasn't sure we'd make it. We've had times in our foster and adoption journey where we didn't know what we were going to do, and someone said, can I take your son for the weekend and give you a break? 
Just this last year, we had some massive medical bills. And in the mail, a check matching what our bills were. Our arms have been held up amazingly. And we want to do the same for others. And I want to challenge you to do the same for others. Because when we feed into and build up the church body, when we pour into consistent community, God is going to do incredible things. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, in the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. I really want to just focus on a few words there. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. When I think about the message of remembering your creator, what I really believe is that God wants us to have a relationship with him. That's what really matters most. That is what lasts forever. It's God's love for us and his desire for us to have a relationship with him. If you've never heard this before, today might be the first time, but I I don't want to skip this opportunity to share with you that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for your sins. And sins are simply anything that we do that doesn't line up with his will. It's when we don't hit the mark. It's when we don't do what we should do. It's when we think what we shouldn't think. But God God doesn't want to leave it at that. He understands that that sin puts a gap between us and him. So he sent his son to die for our sins, to pay the price so that we can now be forever reconnected with God. What matters most and lasts forever ultimately is your eternal destination. It's whether your eternity is going to be with God or whether it's going to be your eternity without God. This is a profound message, I believe. Last week, Pastor Kevin talked about God's timing, that there's a time for everything. And my reality is, or what I believe is the reality, is that today is the time for someone to accept Jesus. Someone who's heard the message of God's love, Jesus' sacrifice, to say, today is the day. I want that gift. I want to be assured of my eternal destination. And if that's you, I just encourage you, talk to one of our staff members here at church. Talk to someone you know who has journeyed along in this Christian faith. Get their input and their guidance. And then let the church know, because we would love to walk with you and to help you along in those next steps. But the reality is for many of you, if not most of you, you've already made that decision. So today is maybe a time to do something different. I go back to chapter 7 when it says wisdom like an inheritance. And I love the idea of inheritance. We have this truth, those of us who know that God loves us and that Jesus died for our sins. And by accepting that gift, we can have eternal life with Jesus. We have amazing wisdom, this knowledge of God's love that we should be looking to pass on like an inheritance to the next generation. For some of you, it's passing it on to your children or your grandchildren. For some of you, maybe passing it on to your neighbors and their children and their grandchildren. For some of you, maybe passing it on to people at work. Maybe it's passing it on to the children that are here at Shoreline's children's ministry or middle school or high school ministries. But God calls us to not only take that wisdom and not hold it on to ourselves, but to pass it on to other people. And that's the spiritual growth marker that we call organic outreach. It's taking that truth, that knowledge that we have, and it's sharing it with the world. Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. What matters most and lasts forever 
is God's love for us and our receiving of that love through accepting of Jesus. When we set our minds on things above, it doesn't mean we ignore what's here on this earth. It means that we look at our lives, we look at the call on those lives through the filter of that love. It's not necessarily pursuing the things of this world for the sake of those, but how can those further God's kingdom? How can those further passing on the message and the truth of God's love to this world? I truly believe that when we focus on those things that matter most, God will honor that. We'll see things in our lives that we never would have experienced without that. And that when we do, we'll be so much more prepared to be used by God to carry out his purpose and to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have chosen to use your people to bring wisdom, to bring accountability, to bring encouragement and support, and most importantly, to bring your message of love for your people to this world that so desperately needs it. I pray that you would spur in us a desire Give us wisdom to act out those steps that you would have us take as individuals to carry out your work in this world. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I send you off, I have a, a few announcements. Uh, if you would like prayer, we've got Pastor Dennis is back here on the dock. For those of you who are here in the courtyard or in the parking lot, if you're at home, you can call 221-0290, and we have someone there that would love to pray for you. And if you're new to our church, we've got a connection center. Again, if you're here in the courtyard or in the parking lot, back where the blue and silver balloons are, Patty's back there, and she'd love to connect with you. If you're at home, we'd love to have you text the word welcome to 221-0290. We'll get you a digital connection card and we'll help you learn more about this church, help you on that journey, and we'll help you to hopefully become totally committed to Jesus Christ because that's our goal. We do also have a baptism class that's taking place today at 1 o'clock. For those of you who have Receive Jesus. You've accepted him as your savior, but you haven't taken that next step for baptism. Whether you've thought about it before or today is the first time, I encourage you. In the Pacific Room, you can just show up there in 28 minutes, and they'd love to tell you more about baptism and this public display of your faith. And if you wouldn't mind, I would love to send you off. This past uh, night of worship, we did what was called a commissioning, and it just just hit my heart in just a neat way. And so today, I know Pastor Kevin does a blessing, which really is that, but, but it really, I really am feeling it as a commissioning, a sending you off on mission to go do God's work into this world. If you would stand and let me do that, I would appreciate it. Heavenly Father, we commission each person here in this courtyard, down in the parking lot, in their homes or other places watching online, either today or in the weeks and months and years to come. Lord, we commission these people to be your voice into this world. We pray that you would guide their steps, that you would give them your wisdom to know how to do your work in this world, ultimately sharing your love with the people that you put in their place. Coming together as a Christian community, consistently encouraging one another, empowering one another, supporting one another. Lord, I pray that you would live in and through each person here as they go about their week. We send them off in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks for being here today.